perfect warlock Her weapons and supplies But you need a place to track your stuff Cause you're so disorganized You click open the webpage You heard about our critical role And now you're ready to kick some butt In that mine shaft full of gnomes It's TNT Hello, everyone. This is Todd Talks. We're back for 2019. I am joined by Mr. Jim Davis and Jonathan Pruitt of WebDM. And today we're talking about um, improvisation and invention in D&D to solve conflicts. So let's go ahead and let's let's dive in. I know I, <laughs> I like to start. I like to like get into things right away. Um, actually, first off, how was your uh, did you have a good holiday season, guys? Oh yeah, yeah, I, I did. I unplugged oh, yeah. completely. I I threw away my phone. I buried it in the backyard and and had a great uh, family focused uh, uh, Christmas. My son's at an age where his toys are finally fun to play with, and he has an attention span of like two minutes. So I get a lot of time with the Duplo. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And, and and yes, I had a I had a I had an all right time as well. We uh, me and the family made it through another uh, another Christmas without hitting all the hot button issues. So that's a Yo, win in my book. Yeah, no, not 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 my family. We we did have a brief fifteen minutes of intense political talk. So yeah, 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 it happens. Mm. It's hard. Mm. It's hard. You mm. have to really be mm. a monk. <laughs> you just have to yeah. stop all that stuff. I have to oh. not do that because I'm like the only person in the room that has my viewpoint. So I have to just kind of just yeah. sit there and just shut up. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, so today, like uh, like I mentioned, we're talking about improvisation and invention. What what are some of the ways? Because this is like something that's very much a two sided issue. Um, because you know it comes from the dungeon master to provide sometimes inventive solutions without being too railroady or obvious and then the players like having that uh letting them know that they can come up with crazy stuff but as long as it doesn't like break the game like how do you balance that how do you balance you know like you know like encouraging players to come up with very inventive solutions without it getting almost like a little too preposterous right well, I mean, that's 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 always the rub, right? You you want players to have agency and autonomy with it, but as the DM, sometimes you like I don't have, I find this sometimes. Uh, I think Jim probably as well. You know what the players can do, and you present this scenario, maybe even thinking in the back of your mind, okay, well they could possibly do this, mm -hmm. but then it comes to the time for them to to take on said scenario, and they're just like straight ahead, head against the wall, just banging their head against the wall, just, just oh, I'm going to run up and hit it, and run up and hit it, and run up and hit it. You're just like, you want to just be like, you have that spell, why aren't you using it? You know? Oh, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so but that that's the problem with being the DM, right? Like, you you don't want to push that on the players. Um, I think with newer players, it's okay to remind them of, mm -hmm. you know, hey, don't be sure to look at all of your abilities, you know, before making a decision, but not uh, pointing them right at the thing that, you know, you might think, oh, they could do that. I don't know. Yeah, I've run into that, to that a lot myself. Because I'll, like, I'll, I'll focus, as a dungeon master, I'll be like, ooh, I'll make the solution this spell or this one warlock ability, and then it's <laughs> like, uh But then, like, it, it's, yeah, you completely blow it as a DM if you're like, oh, you have this thing. And then they don't get it. I'm like, you know, I'm Paige. <laughs> and then it's no longer an adventure. How about for you, Jim? <laughs> I think having a, a strong basis in the rules and sort of like understanding the the underlying mechanical structures of whatever game you're playing. So for fifth edition, this would be like the DC scale, right? Like what are the DC benchmarks and 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 how do I say like make rulings for spontaneous ability checks that I might not necessarily be ready for because the players cooked up a harebrained scheme, <laughs> you know, for dealing with something. And now I'm having to make that on the fly ruling, uh, you know, having read the rule books, having tried out a lot of the options in there, a dungeon master is, a, has a, a better grasp and more confidence when it comes to, uh, you know, players just 
thinking up whatever is off the top of their head and you having to go, all right, okay, first off, is this even probable? <laughs> is, you know, can they, is this even in the realm of possibility? And if so, all right, you know, it's a DC 18 or it's a whatever, or maybe you're so impressed by the, uh, the execution and planning that you're just like, yeah, it, it succeeds. And there's a complication down the road because of it or an unintended con unintended consequence. Um, right. That's where I would start with a lot of these things with creative problem solving. Yeah, there are things that I purposely don't bring up as a player because I'm like, okay, I don't know. Like, you have to be a certain kind of dungeon master to allow everything. <laughs> <laughs> like, Molt Earth, for example. If there's a river nearby <laughs> mm. yeah. and you spend right. the time with Molt Earth, you can, like, flood a cave or an entire town and city. Mm -hmm. And just have a great time with it. I mean, a lot of this boils down to how much time are you giving the players and, and the PCs, right? Like if if you're if they never have a clock ticking against them, if they never mm -hmm. have a, a pressure mm -hmm. of needing to make a decision quickly and move through with that, that uh, decision in a timely manner, and they've got all day to just mold earth on a riverbank and flood the goblin caves, <laughs> then then it's one of those things where that, that's on you as a dungeon master, right? Like that's you've got a lot of tools at your disposal for making sure that those uh i don't know idle time and pc hands doesn't get uh, the better of your campaign yeah but I, but i would i would counter that jim with sometimes like mm -hmm. in 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 real world like when two armies are, are coming at each other there are times to set up the battlefield you know digging trenches to stifle like cavalry charges things like that because i mean to me that's like if you have mold earth or like shaped stone i mean why aren't you and you have the time and you know like oh there's this group of orcs that ride wargs and they're charging mm -hmm. and they're going to charge at us tomorrow well why aren't you digging trenches in order to hopefully catch their their charge and and right. trip them up or something like that i mean it, 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 i think it's okay to kind of to look at like kind of siege tactics and things like that and things in the real world and look at mm -hmm. look at the spell list and be like what can i actually emulate and, and do since i don't have a huge army or workforce what can i actually pull off uh and you know you might be surprised at, at, at what you can do with some of these spells certainly certainly <laughs> how, how do you get inventive with combat or even to avoid combat because um it's an older game, but the original Mass Effect, I mm. love because, sort of, you can convince the villain not to be the villain anymore. Sure. Now it doesn't necessarily work out, but it, it, yeah. it is like. It, it, but it's a very. It was a very um, important moment in a video game, at least for me, to finally have that option of like, okay, I don't have to have another boss battle. Yeah, I can yeah, right. maybe, like, convince the villain to stop. And like to have those options, like how important is that for you in your games and in the games that you play to maybe have a different solution that isn't combat focused? Well, I, I know that I, I try to always, uh, I try to flesh out my NPCs as much as possible. And that's, that's mostly from sitting at the foot of the master Jim Davis for so long and knowing like, your, your your villains, your NPCs need to be fully fleshed out. They just don't like, oh, they're evil and they're going to destroy the world and that's it. Like, no, 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 there's a reason for it. And if the players discover some of that info, that 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 secret, you know, behind the scenes info on the villain, I always try to make sure that there is a way to circumvent combat. If you know what to say and say it in the right order, that you can actually like kind of catch the villain off guard and be like, well, maybe, uh, you know, or, or at least, you know, make them reconsider for a minute. Um, because there there needs to be multiple roads to to get to the end like you, you got to make it interesting because your players are going to come up with so many different things that you don't even think about so you need to you know make sure you have a, a combat way to fit to finish this make sure you have a way that they can use their skills to complete this challenge make sure that maybe it's the dimple they diplomats their way out of it and they talk the villain down off the ledge and away from the big button to blow up the world you know like it's there are many roads to nirvana and anyone who says there's only one path is just trying to sell you a map, Todd. I'm excited for diplomacy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I pull that I pull that off quite often. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. always trying to, work to, to, to word my way out of a situation. Does that end up being uh, sometimes a... Uh... See, social ticks are a tricky thing. And I can't define it for myself, but I love it when the argument is so strong, I don't make them roll. Mm. <laughs> like, like, uh -huh. like, I don't feel like you've deceived me as a DM. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Does that come up, 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 up often for you as well? 
where you're just I, like, okay, your, your argument is down. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times that's how I run uh, most social encounters, where I pr my preference is to not necessarily roll. Now, yeah, that sometimes gets in trouble because I, I do have players who have, like, say, low stat, low charisma, mm -hmm. <laughs> but but play as if they're uh, a high charisma. And it's sort of, like, revealed once they do have to roll, like, oh, no, their character's really bad at this. <laughs> uh, and so, but then that, that's a fun challenge, right? Now we have to figure out how someone could be eloquent and, potentially persuasive while also failing to actually persuade the other person what what you know how do they put their foot in their mouth or what do they accidentally say um what does the character accidentally say that that might not make that play out exactly how you think it's supposed to go um or create an unintended consequence uh, well and you have your own party to like help ruin that for you as well oh sure yeah yeah, yeah there's usually yeah they, there's no amount of uh helpful advice <laughs> from fellow party members uh but to kind of like right to, to sort of back up to what you were talking about where where you can circumvent a sort of boss battle through just talking to someone i think it really it starts with like everyone at the table being open to possibilities other than this npc is going to end up dead because we want the xp and the treasure and and the mm -hmm. other thing and th there's only one quest going on and it's to kill this npc because they're doing something bad and must be stopped like if that's the kind of game you're running more power to you play that 100 percent and give it your go nothing wrong with kick down the door hack and slash D D. But if you've got a, a, a living, breathing world and you're trying to create uh, situations in it that seem plausible, that, that fit with the fiction of the world you're creating, then, yeah, the, the door's open for creative solutions there because you're not offering just uh, one possibility for an outcome or one possibility for a solution. You're simply presenting a problem or an obstacle and asking the players to solve that. They've made characters. They've got resources. How do they solve it? That's where the fun of play happens, right? So. Now, yeah. do you often uh, use your own settings? Because I, I am actually, I almost always use my own setting because of that. Because I really like it when the players can cause so many ramifications in the world based on their decisions that it kind of opens it up for more sometimes insane plot lines. Um, right. I know Chronicles of Riddick is probably not the best example to be taking story uh, tips from. <laughs> but, you know, the fact that, like, this... I mean, spoiler alert if you've not seen Chronicles of Riddick, but <laughs> he, and, uh, he accidentally becomes the Emperor. <laughs> and there is something very charming about that in any D&D yeah. &D adventure. Is that possibility? Yeah, yeah, he becomes Conan in space. That's how I. Yeah. Like, that's how I came to terms with that movie. Like at first, I was a little like, uh, but then I was like, no, it's Conan in space, and I'm like, okay, I like this movie now. Um, yeah. But, but yes, I, I think that the players should have uh, the opportunity. As Jim Sorry, goes through I'm, all the I'm addressing the, the comments of jaundice in the chat, Mike. <laughs> I say we all. I, I, all go to war. I appreciate everyone's all concern about my life. life. <laughs> Sorry, bro, I didn't mean to interrupt. Jim is okay. <laughs> He's well. <laughs> He's fine. He's fine. We're all fine here. Um, he's never had a drop of uh, liquor in his life. Um, he's gonna, his liver's good. Um, yeah, be black and white, Jim Davis. Be noir, Jim Davis. Yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's all be noir. Noir no, uh, DM. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I think that 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 crazy shit should be able to happen, and that's why I like using my own my own setting, my own spelljammer uh, inspired cosmic setting, because I want the craziest crap to happen that could possibly happen. You know, um, you know, in, in Jim's in our original uh, campaign where Jim and, and, and our, our home group played, you know, they eventually became like heroes of the dwarves. But the dwarves don't really like anybody who's not dwarves because but the thing is, they found this epic dwarven hero just on a random like, oh, we're going to mine this comet for some some whatever. And they find this pod like lodged at the heart of this comet and then they, uh, they revive him. And, you know, it was just a random encounter that they did it just right. And they they got him uh, back to his people. And, you know, all of a sudden they're ha it's the end of a new hope and they're being, having medals put on their on their chest and everybody's having a good old time. You know, that should be a that should be a possibility at, at any turn. Mm -hmm. What is the I most eccentric thing that you've done for both of you in terms of D&D &D play? Like, again, D&D &D has no limits. And sometimes right. a reward is actually a curse. Like, what's how big have you gone? I, I mean, I think for me, my out of the abyss game was my per, my my purposeful attempt to break fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons 
to find whatever combination it took to make this game unplayable because I wanted to see where the limits of it of it were. And so uh, everybody made an evil character. We've got a bunch of underdark Dwergar and Drow and and, and vampire necromancers and Asimar Death Cleric who eventually became a Lich. Um, and I gave them artifacts of, of like legendary artifacts around seventh, sixth, seventh level. Uh, we're talking Black Razor, uh, the Demonomicon, Axe of the Dwarvish Lords. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and I just wanted to see what happens when you give players that much power and and explicitly they are evil, right? Like they're not good people. They, right. They want, they want to get the demons out because they're messing things up, but they're not here to to you know help anything. And we wrecked the Forgotten Realms. I I treated it like my homebrew setting. We completely trashed it, uh, and by the end of it, the players are probably the most powerful villains in the Forgotten Realms by the end of that particular uh, campaign. <laughs> so, it's um, it was it was just insane the the kind of stuff that we got up to. And the cleric player over about sixteen levels of play ended up getting three divine interventions. So don't count that power out, folks. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, one of them was like the fourth earthquake we threw at Menzo Branson uh, in the Noble Quarter to, to <laughs> pretty much 12, kill the entire. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah, like we... the one spell that can just take all of that down. <laughs> like <laughs> literally, an amazing one. spell. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, and also Black Razor will turn any evil fighter into a sociopath. I'm sure. I'm convinced. Every... Yes, yeah. And I and I, I and I need to, I need to believe that so that I know that it's just not me. It's just not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it ended up being this really epic game because I was just like, listen, I'd never run a game or I'd only run one other game in Forgotten Realms, and that was Horde of the Dragon Queen. And I was like, let's just trash the place. Like, let's treat this like I would my homebrew. And my homebrew, I've just utterly destroyed several times over because of yeah. well, mostly because of player actions. Uh, and so I figured it'd be the same to do it uh, in a very familiar uh, location. <laughs> Yeah, I very much I I am very prone to like make someone the king or queen of a realm and mm -hmm. see that unravel for yeah, them so yeah. quickly. Yeah. yeah. I love oh, yeah, this yeah. The, the immediate stress of like at first it's like, "Oh, awesome, I'm king." And then it's like, "Oh, no." <laughs> right. Yeah, right. And then, and then now you're king. Yeah. No, I have yeah, to yeah. make decisions and I have like I feel guilty for NPCs that are not real. <laughs> mm -hmm. like, everybody bl everybody blames you for everything uh yeah yeah it's, yeah, it's a lot to deal with like do you do you now when it comes to like inventiveness do you ever try and mix it up uh when it comes to how you start an adventure because a lot of players and, and this is why i notice especially new players sometimes they think if you put this creature or this person into the game they're like that's vi a villain they're evil mm -hmm. i must mm -hmm. fight it right and Sometimes it's hard to explain that. How do I express to you that you will die? <laughs> like that, I think that's like it's very much on the DM, right? To like describe something as this like so terrifying and impossible to destroy. Like, please don't try to kill this thing because then I have to kill you. Um, how, how do you, right, right. how do you how do you create menace? Sometimes, like if you introduce like they need to talk to a dragon at level one. How do you introduce that sense of dread and also like? Use using fear and dread to like kind of keep your players safe <laughs> from them from themselves for themselves yeah um so there are a couple ways like i mean you can just flat out tell them that's sort of like the blunt ham-fisted yeah. sort of like hey guys like fyi this creature's like cr 23 uh you know it'll mop the floor with you in a bonus action uh, <laughs> you know don't even don't even try uh, mm -hmm. But you could do things like, you know, there's the typical sort of like skeletons on the way, like, you know, grizzly trophies left over from the dragon, right? Like, so maybe they're right. on their way to the lair and they find the half dissolved corpse of a big ass water buffalo or something, uh, you know, they're looking for a black dragon or something like that. Or or mm -hmm. they uh, they meet a couple of people in the tavern who bear debilitating and lifelong scars from a fight with this thing, who can tell right. you what their fight went like and you can see what happened to them. Um, those are some ways that I would, it, I find it makes it more effective. You're introducing an element of the game world that the players can now sort of interact with and explore. Um, and it's, it sort of like keeps that uh, that fiction going as opposed to just you can go there, but you're probably going to die. It's a red skull. Like, don't even <laughs> don't even attempt it <laughs> uh, sort of situation. And sometimes it needs to be that they walk in the lair and you don't like overwhelm them with 
damage and, and you know oh, i don't even need to roll to hit you i'm just showing off over here but that dragon can toy with them the threat of violence the threat of something unknown mm -hmm. particularly if like they didn't realize it or they're getting cocky um maybe show off some of its abilities that it can do like don't direct them at the players but like have that dragon just waste a piece of the terrain with its breast weapon or you know fly around and, and completely outmaneuver the party with its uh, aerial acrobatics to show how dangerous uh, it would be to fight mm -hmm. so that's always what, a good reason to have a friendly npc nearby to have get killed just, exactly <laughs> yeah. there's always yeah. a reason to keep a friendly npc nearby to utterly and brutally murder just to prove a point <laughs> you need that red shirt you need that red yeah, shirt and, or you got a red shirts everywhere uh and sometimes right. you know you, you can do that and jim davis is accomplished dm at that and then the players don't listen like our party that went still don't yeah sometimes they don't talk to a red dragon because we were like there's a dragon slayer with us and he's like let's go kill it and it's like yeah he, he, he killed us in like three rounds four rounds i think the simulacra was, killed was, in the three rounds and then the real dragon showed up it was a simulacra of a dragon yeah the simulacra uh killed us or pretty much took us out it was it was so not it even was the dragon pathetic. yeah not even the dragon no yeah. no uh, <laughs> but i think that brings up a point right like this this uh the reason why the party got into this sticky situation tpk is what it was uh was that one of the players was focused on one thing and one thing only which was killing the dragon and if you if dungeon master you're you're say like you want to encourage creative solutions you want to encourage inventiveness one of the things that you can do is give xp for something other than the most direct brutal blunt force approach which from you know baseline dnd is you're still getting most of xp for fighting monsters and slaying them or overcoming them but what if uh you say borrowed from older uh, editions of dungeons and dragons and said well you know gold is your measure of xp how much treasure you can acquire that's sort of mm -hmm. what the game is about we're all sort of ne'er-do-well desperados trying to get rich that's the point of the game if the point of your game is a very character focused story driven uh sort of D, &D game um then maybe you give XP for certain character milestones that you discuss with the party or the individual player. You say like, all right, well, you know, I, I want my character to undergo this sort of journey in this heroic setting. You sort of work behind the scenes to get a feel for what the player wants. Changing the way they get XP means that they're going to think differently about the game and might right. surprise you with how they approach uh, the problems that you put in front of them. Yeah. Do you know everything's okay? Everything no, no, everything's okay. Everything's okay over here. <laughs> Our roommate just tried to burn the house down. No. Uh, okay, okay, okay. That's why, that's yeah, why dude, I, kind of, I've converted to milestones. Like I, 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 and now I've used, I'm starting to use milestones for just those cool moments where when we're playing, like not even for the character, but like if a great moment happens in the game, I'm like, well, that's a milestone. Like mm -hmm, something right. really amazing just happened in the game. Um, and we had a great time. And I'm like, this is a good time to level. That was like, you pulled it up, you pulled off something off that's incredible um but you know definitely you need a party or a group of friends who are okay with that little bit more loosey-goosey kind of progression oh yeah um, yeah i mean you want to talk about yeah. loosey-goosey i've i've run games where i literally just wait for the players to tell me they're ready to level up <laughs> like, you know, like hey, we're tired of being seventh level like we've played a couple of sessions at seventh we got a feel for the abilities you know, I wouldn't let yeah. him tell me that every time we played, but you know, it would be but like, that's a yeah, very honest, to... like that's when you are like at peak honesty with your players, oh, right? Sure. And they're yeah, just yeah. like, I think yeah. I'm ready. I think I'm ready to go forth. <clears throat> yeah. You know? <laughs> like, I think I'm ready for a level up. Yeah. And sometimes you can just tell you're like, oh yeah, we're, we're ready. We're ready for bigger monsters, bigger threats, uh, you know, a bigger scope for the game. Uh, yeah. I think it's, 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 there's no hard and fast rule to it. Do whatever works for your group. Come on, people. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and I was and I was gonna go back to a earlier point before the fire alarm, um, uh, <laughs> talking about uh, ways to kind of kind of throw the players off uh, from the front from the first to think about combat a little differently. Um, like in, in the first com real combat in my Star Wars Bound game, it was on a Neogi Death Spider, and it, they were like normal human sailors, and I described them as being like emaciated and sunken eyes, and they're like scared, and so they they board this ship ready to, to kick some ass, and the people that are standing up against them are like shaking, 
And so they were like really thrown off, but I wanted to set a precedent of, you don't really know who your real enemy is. And that's kind of the whole point of Star Wars Bound is like, and Emma, I know you're out there listening, so pay attention. Um, uh, but you don't know who the actual enemy is. So running into every combat wholesale, just ready to just cut things down is maybe not the way to go. And they, thankfully they kind of figured it out. Although when you have a barbarian uh, that's a uh, path of the storm Herald and she burned one of the guys who, anyway, it was sad. He, <laughs> they actually killed one of the sailors. Uh, but then they, 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 they commemorated uh, yeah. him in Memorial. Uh, peace out, Steve. Or I'm sorry. Yeah. St. Stephen. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> now, uh, like I, I, I fairly recently did something because I, I, because again i'm always trying to break out of that mold of okay we started in a tavern um right, you're, right. you're in a small town and some goblins need to die and increasingly i get a little bit more like i i think jim's already far more advanced than i am in this department but like i started a game and i gave them a bag of holding and they like they found one and they opened it up and thor's ha- thor's hammer is inside that's a yes. bad day that's a bad day. <laughs> you're a love- that's you're a level people one. want that hammer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's like just like when you find like a, a like you're in the woods and you find an airplane that's crashed and it's just full of cocaine and money. Like you're that's like, right. okay, yeah. here we go. Well, it's one of those things like yeah, what's the saying, you know, like, oh, I owe someone uh, you know, five grand, that's my problem. I owe them five million, that's their problem. It, it's right, sort of yeah. like a similar <laughs> thing, right? Like you someone wants Thor's hammer. Someone wants black razor. Someone wants those things, and uh, it, you know you're going to need to give your players tools in order to get creative solutions to the problems you throw at them. And if you choose magic items and you choose maybe to do something crazy, like I don't know, give them a scroll of wish at second level, or you know, an artifact that they can just get themselves in trouble with, making sure that those things are tied into the game world. That's not just uh, an item that you you know, used a command code to appear in the game. It's a thing that someone made that has a reputation, a history. Um, all of these, to me, all these things, like having having an idea of what you would do with them means that you have a good idea for how your setting will react when the players do something unexpected. Um, and so that's why it's worthwhile to think about these things, how the stuff that you're introducing is connected to other elements of your game world. And you can sort of like relax with the need to have the game be a certain way or to progress towards a certain goal and can develop that confidence that you would need to let the players exercise their creativity and mm-hmm. get themselves into trouble. Because they'll will, they will. They'll get themselves into a lot of trouble. And that's how you keep a game going is by, oh yeah, you thought this was a solution and it solved this problem, but it created another one. Um, mm-hmm. right. And therefore the adventure continues. Or it, I would say another example uh, of just kind of throwing something crazy at the players that Jim Davis has done. We've talked about on the show many times was throwing a ring with a with a with a devil or a demon prince in it uh, at a party that didn't have anybody who could cast detect magic or identify. And so, you know, my player decided to put it on just to see what it did. Yeah, and that was the entire <laughs> campaign after that, which was doing what it wanted to get it out of the ring so I could take the ring off and not be a. Uh, uh, a half fiend uh sure. so you know that that's that's one way to do it too i i but i think that example raises a very good point in that there's two sort of resources that you have when you play dungeons and dragons and that you have your character sheet with the character abilities and spells and, and things like that and, and some of them are really like uh like light switches identify or detect magic is like this you either have it or you don't and once you have it you know the information or, or you don't there's not really a lot of uncertainty uh, that's one way and uh, and i think that for beginning players focusing on what their characters can do and looking at the character sheet is important to understanding the game but as you get experience with it not looking at your character sheet setting it aside and just like approaching the problem and going like how would i deal with this uh there's almost always like a mundane solution or or uh, some kind of workaround to accomplish your goals without necessarily being like, all right, what spell can I cast or what ability can I use? Have we gotten that long rest yet? Um, and it, that also reinforces a sort of like immersive style of play where you don't necessarily think of the game as a game. You think of it as a living, breathing uh, place. Right. It, it can be a mistake. Of like, and it's something I, I've certainly, it's easy to fall into where you let your character sheet play you instead of you playing mm-hmm. your character sheet where I am playing a hex blade right now. And it's kind of hard not for me to look at the entire universe as something to hex. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, 
you're the one that's gonna die. <laughs> I got I gotta do my thing. That's what I do. <laughs> yeah, it's right there it's, in the title. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. a style of D and D that I enjoy sometimes. That very much character sheet focused. It, it's to me, I find they they tend to be hack and slash, but they don't have to be. Right. Um, and it, but I, it took for me playing older versions of D and D as a player, not as a dungeon master, because most of my experience is behind the screen. Uh, and looking at a character and going like, gosh, I have six stats and one spell. How am I going to survive this dungeon? Two hit points. And realizing that I can lie. These dwarves up ahead don't know that the illusion I just conjured is just an illusion or that, uh, you know, the fact that I put them all to sleep doesn't mean I can't do something worse. The One of the best moments as a just a hobbyist <laughs> for me was playing with a brand new player and I had lied to the dungeon master in character and the other player turns and looks at me and is just like, wait a minute we can lie to him we yeah. don't have to tell him the exactly. truth now it's like no man make up like i'm not a first level magic user i'm you know a powerful mage you should be very afraid of me you know i could do terrible things to you like that's the that kind of um thinking about the game like that is is a good step towards creative uh, problem solving because you're not like bound by your eight by eleven character sheet and what you can and can't do yeah, you know, especially when you look at evil characters, right? Like when you look at if if you want to look at examples from f television and film, like Littlefinger is not a powerful person in no. any way other than just nope. being pretty good at lying, and that can right. easily just be on the player being convincing if the mm -hmm. DM allows sure. it. And Loki, the sure. same thing. Like Loki rarely exhibits super powerful abilities. Mm -hmm. It's knowledge. I mean, these could be first level characters for 99% of their screen time, right? Right, right. Oh, oh, and it's, oh, yeah. the other thing that strikes me about them is that they know what the people around them want. And mm -hmm. this means that you have a dungeon master who's willing to have NPCs who are fleshed out or, you know, right. I'm thinking like an example of like, all right, you know, we have a, an, an enemy that needs to be stopped. We could do the traditional, we're going to go fight them, and, and just tear our way through however many levels uh, to get to them. Or you can start researching who that person is. Who do they know? What are their goals? What's their background? Is there a way that you can find something that they don't want you to know that might undermine them? Or is there a way for you to acquire allies that might uh, check their power, allowing you to move more freely? So those are some things that you can sort of start to think about if you're a player we're like, all right, well, you know, we've got this big damn quest we got to fulfill. Like, we could just hack our way through it and blast it, and we'd have a great time. And, you know, that's some D&D &D shit right there. <laughs> Sorry. But we could approach this uh, like, um, you know, I, I'm, I have a goal, and the indirect approach gets me what I want without putting myself in danger or, uh, you know, risking what I have. I'll let somebody else do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, uh, to to go to the original uh, question about um, ways to to keep from being played by your character and being stuck in that that mindset, like Jim mentioned, playing other editions of D and D, playing many different editions, uh, playing other games. Other games. Uh, I mean, they yeah. do exist. You know, uh, I know this is a D and D Beyond thing, but playing other games <laughs> allows you to think. Cut it. It's off. We're done. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. <laughs> Uh, but it allows you to think differently on how, how, even if it's just like abilities in other games or just, or whatever, but it, it forces you to think differently. I know once I started playing a lot other games, when I started streaming, I realized when I came back to D and D, I was thinking about my characters much differently, just having that diversity of viewpoints um, and different ways of, of coming at a, a game about, you know, overcoming challenges and things like that. Yeah, I mean, especially like if you've also taken a character from multiple editions. I, I, I have a character, my first character, Averin, who is basically, he started out as a ranger, and now he makes more sense as a warlock. Mm -hmm. Like, that's where that guy would be. Um, yeah. And that, because I've been playing that character so long, like, he's always not going to be his class. He's never going to be a subclass or whatever else. He's always going to be a fast talker. He's always going to be like, and back then, you know, charisma was not commonly used for a lot. Like first edition, mm -hmm. second edition, that, you know, unless you were a paladin, it wasn't necessarily mm -hmm. always that important. But then now that yeah. we have like the sorcerer and the warlock, that's where a lot of the shiftier characters tend to go or more manipulative or inspiring. So, yeah. 
Sorry, I don't. I don't really have a point there. <laughs> That's just me well, monologuing. It, <laughs> it, yeah. it was. It was a great point, regardless. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what What is the absolute bonkers thing that your players have ever done, or you've witnessed other players do, that was like an, just a remarkably smart solution to a problem? Like where you're like, okay, I thought this is this was going to go this way. I thought this was going to be a battle, or I thought it was going to go um, into more political realm. But they came up with this idea, and I, I was you charmed me. I'm all in as a dungeon master. What what moments have you had like that? I had a player. So we're getting close to the end of like a tier one, sort of like fifth or sixth level. Uh, they're taking on the the big bad who'd been threatening their their hometown. And it's it, the big bad's in like a flying pyramid, and one of the players decides to get captured. Uh, and everybody else is planning which where they're which assault team they're going to be a part of, and loading up their combat spells or anything. And he's like, "I just leave in the middle of the night, and I I look for an enemy patrol, and I try to get captured because he wanted to be in the room with the big bad, wanted to talk to him, wanted to just get information out of him." He figured he could survive like an interrogation or something, and that being that close to the big bad when the power dynamic was so much in favor of the villain uh, would give him access. And that that action has uh, we're still playing through the consequences of that nine months later uh, for wow know, both the character and and the the uh, the game uh, itself. So it really was one of those moments where you're just like, yeah, and the most D and D players are not going to be like, I surrender, take you know, take me to prison. Um, you know, surrendering is worse than death for a lot of D&D players. And so it really kind of took me. I was like, oh, wow, yeah, let's play that out. Um, yeah, and in the escape, I made him fight a pain elemental, which was pretty fun. That was, that was a fun time. Oh, wow. <laughs> pain. <laughs> Played by Mr. The T. The element of pain. Yeah. Played right. by like a psychic, like a from psychic Rocky elemental, Green. you know. I mean, has anyone yeah. made a surprise elemental? I mean... Oh, that's a good one, though. Yeah, so, right, yeah. yeah. It only emotional shows up states that people have elemental uh, essences. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the, the a the shock value and the puns alone um, are endless. <laughs> so, I, copyright. I'm going to copyright. Yeah, there you go. Surprise there you go. elemental. <laughs> the element of surprise. Nobody um, expects the, the surprise. Adventure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How about for you, Jonathan? Is there anything that you've like witnessed that has just been like that was great? That was th that that was yeah. some. Yeah, I, in my game not too long ago, uh, one of my players, Greg, who's playing like the 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 squishiest halfling rogue, like had like an eight charisma or con, so he only like he was like six level, seventh level with like twenty four hit points, you know, like I mean, just like no HP whatsoever. And they were they were doing this fight against uh, a couple of these tele these telekinetic humans that are like being worked on or operated on by illithids and there's the illithid overseer and he's behind a wall of force in his room and he's watching this weapons test of him of these people fighting the party and i'm sitting here thinking like he's back there monologuing and throwing bar you know jabs and, and verbal whatever and i'm like in my head i'm like well he's behind a wall of force they're not gonna really mess with him he never i never intended for him to get into combat and Greg, as Elry Tossbottle, decides to run up there and then Misty step on the other side of the wall and attack him with like this, this element that I had introduced, these crystals that are explosive. He throws them all at the guy's feet and shoots them. And I'm like, fuck. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and I was completely taken aback. And I'm like, well, they explode and kill him. I mean, you know, luckily there's other people in his cadre that are just going to bring him back but it really caught me off guard because i never thought he would have done been like brave enough to go right at this illithid who anyway that 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 is probably the biggest thing recently that i can think of um are the, is that kind of like is that the joy of being a dungeon master after like you spend so much time coming up with plans i love it when my plans are wrecked weirdly <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. Isn't, I mean, that, isn't that like yeah. one of the joys? Of, is that almost like, you know, and not in a condescending way, but it's like seeing your kids grow up, you know, like <laughs> when, when the players like just come up with stuff and they're, they're starting, starting to kind of dungeon master you in the game. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have almost like nothing to do. You're just like watching this, this happen. Watching your like, yeah. Yeah. I, I like it because for a significant portion of my DMing uh, time, it, it was all the, everything was one way 
right? Like the, mm-hmm. you know, as a DM, you're like prepping for hours and hours and hours and, you know, creating this vast world and all these complicated plots. And we're going to sit down with the players and, and they're going to play through it. Uh, and then uh, at some point, you know, as that like need to drive the campaign w- uh, relaxed, to realize like, man, there's all these other people who can input and offer things and, it started for me with like one person suggesting a, a, a possible solution and going like, that's way better than what I thought up. Like I spent three hours thinking up a thing and that's, that's garbage compared to this. Like they don't need to know that they, <laughs> that I'm going to take that and incorporate it. Um, that for me, that was a moment of like really making sure that everybody at the table had a voice and could contribute. Um, and you know, it's why, it's why I love the game now. Oh, no. Yeah. Now, so, someone in chat just brought up an interesting question, and it is something that I have struggled with at, at, at times, is do you always let someone succeed if they get a natural 20? Ooh. Oh. On an yeah. attack, yes. On an attack, yes, because I see a nat 20. That's that's Bard hitting the dragon with the arrow. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Oh, yeah, they, yeah that's able pure, to do something. Yeah. But if it's not an attack... To me, a 20 is just a 20. It is not a critical success. If it's a skill check or a saving throw, I mean, that's I'm sorry to say, but even if you're all a 20 on a saving throw against something monumentous, maybe you're still going to fail. I mean, if the DC is high enough, right? I mean, it's just something that you just can't uh, overcome uh, without some help. You know what I mean? Right. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't throw that a lot at the players. Maybe once in a campaign, would they make a save that even with a 20, you know? Whatever, but yeah, only on attacks. I, I, I've run I've run into this myself uh, once, particularly mm-hmm. of note was uh, my own wife deceived God, <laughs> and it wasn't like high stakes as much as just trying to delay them. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> like it was like, hey, how you do- how you doing? Don't look over there, <laughs> kind of thing. And I'm like, she got natural twenty. I'm like, I have to allow it, but like, it can only go so far. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and also, <laughs> tricking a god isn't something <laughs> they should necessarily be like. Well, you won this round, but <laughs> now <laughs> you've deceived. <laughs> you've made, <laughs> made things so much worse. Your natural yeah. 20 might as well have been a one. Yeah. <laughs> it right. would be better I, I, if it was a one. It's like you, you, there's still like limits on what's possible, right? Like you can, it doesn't matter what, you know, your persuasion yeah. skill was. If the king doesn't have the money to give you, the king right. cannot give you that loan or, or whatever. So I think like you should always keep that in mind. I, I'm torn, right? Like I like the idea of there being a possibility, always a possibility for success and always a possibility for failure that the one in 20 represent. But at the same time, I can see like there's some things where, gosh, having a five percent chance of utter failure uh, <laughs> on this thing is a um, it, it seems implausible or or would pr- at least prevent me from uh, making that decision as a player. Um, I like them for attacks. I kind of like them for saving throws, personally, uh, as well. Like, what does a critical save mean? Was a fumble on a, a save mean? Um, but not for necessarily for skills. I remember third editions like DC 100 to to like balance on clouds kind of thing and man if if that's the kind of game we're playing that's great but i, it, I don't think it works for for most games yeah that's, have, that's have crafty had... tiger stuff yeah yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> i'm like you're, you're always like yeah, yeah you're exalted you're right like i love always in, in our pop culture <laughs> sync we're always thinking the exact same reference um yeah. is it like how do you how do you generally talk to a player who has this is a question also from chat who has, like you said, they have a low charisma score, but they're very charismatic as a player and how they play their character. Do they need to adjust themselves to be a little bit more in line or understand that charisma can be two different things? Like you could be, it's kind of like Han Solo. And this is my mm-hmm. argument about Han Solo is everyone thinks he should have a really high charisma. And I don't think he does. I think he has no, incredibly no. low <laughs> charisma and he gets a natural 20 once in a while. Mm-hmm. But yeah. most people, oh, he yeah. tries to charm, it goes terrible almost mm-hmm. every it's, time. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't usually end up very well. I would say, like, listen, you let a, I'm, a, I'm of the opinion of you let a player play the character they want to play. If having the mechanical weight of a good charisma was important to them, they would have put that there in their stat. If they want to run their mouth off and, and talk and, you know, all kinds of things, uh, people 
you know, are, are complex people. <laughs> people are complex creatures, and sometimes you you attempt things that you're not good at. Maybe they sometimes have you think you're good at something, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> you know, they just <laughs> rub people. Yeah, you're, you're like a down, man, but I need you to stop. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If you're gonna keep talking, at least choose some gum or something. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, same with like um like a low wisdom or something like that. They can pretend to be very wise and insightful and you know a lot of stuff, but they're not gonna make those insight checks to spot people lying. They're not gonna um you know pass the 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 things that they need to pass mechanically to reinforce that concept. So then it's like a Han Solo situation where they maybe think they're charismatic or attempt it anyway because why not? Um, but they're not really good at it. Yeah. Right. It sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I would say any, kind of an example of that and, and to kind of piggyback on the last point also. Uh, same player in my game, Greg. Uh, they broke into an illithid cult, an illithid cult that is all humans, and there are no humans in this party. And he's a halfling, and he rolls a 20 to persuade them that he is the chosen of, chosen one of their cult, but he's just a child. And so I was like, okay. And so, but because I knew the fact of not fighting straight up means that they're going to get further inside this building with all these cultists and all these illithids, and they get halfway through before they realize where they really are, and then it dawns on them. And I'm just sitting back like, hey, man, you got a 20 on that roll. Well done. Way to sneak inside this cult where there's only, what, five of you? And there's mm -hmm. hundreds of these people? Yeah. Good I already know that. what I would do. I yeah. See, yeah. If they got like a 20 to convince them they're the chosen one, then that just means you're... What is an Elithid's concept of a chosen one? You're the one, right. like, you'll be the chosen one once we stick a tadpole in you. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> like, but that's what they're waiting on. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You'll be the chosen, chosen one. chosen one is not a good situation to be in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not for a cult. No, not for a cult. Yeah. <laughs> right. Lots, lots of uh, chosen ones don't make it. Sure. <laughs> like, chosen ones. They, uh, they're gonna awesome. you're the chosen one to eat tonight um <laughs> yeah yeah i think yeah i think that is a good solution like a 20 is a success but only for the moment <laughs> yeah 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 it got and you the door long term damage yeah <laughs> have you ever lost control of your game and had to like at the end of the session just had to regroup as a dm where you're like okay how do i write the ship and and is there a danger when you're playing D and D, when you or any game where you're like you've let things get almost a little too fantastical, or things have you made it things maybe a little too easy, or you let them you know create that river and now the whole town's drowned and because without uh, suffering in D and D or failure, it doesn't always feel like a real world, right? Like you need those limitations to make the game feel real and to feel those stakes because otherwise a win doesn't feel like a win eh, anymore. Yeah, and then and then everybody feels like Saitama uh, because there is no more struggle in their life, and you know, right. uh, I, I will say that yes, that has happened to me many times in the past. Like I've only run two like actual campaigns, the one I'm currently doing and the one with Jim and them in the same world, because they would always fall apart because I didn't understand things would get crazy and I just didn't understand how to make sense of it. You know what I mean? And I that happens and i think dms you know if that when if that does happen hey it's gonna happen uh either talk to your players and be like hey guys that got a little crazy okay and maybe we need to rein it in a little bit um or you know you do what i did and i would just like all right that's it we're done and uh just pull the plug on the campaign because uh, i'm just like i don't know what to do you know <laughs> well, how about for you jim uh yeah it's happened before and uh to me it's it's one of those moments where I think that we want to find a solution that doesn't break the fourth wall and like we can maintain that we're still playing this game and, and nothing's changed. But this, if it's just bad, if you as a DM are just like, gosh, I don't know what to do. I can't handle these, say, like really powerful characters because I gave them something that's uh, that I would <laughs> regret or you know, through a series of crazy die rolls, they managed to overcome something uh, very quickly. Uh, I think my internet is uh, unstable for me. But uh, anyway, um, I, for me, this is a moment where you kind of sit down with the players and say, hey, guys, listen, I, I'm struggling as a dungeon master to come up with something challenging and engaging for you because of X, Y, Z. Is there a way we can come up with some solutions for reining it in? 
you know, a compromise that we can reach so that maybe some of these abilities or whatever that you've acquired, uh, you can still use and, and have fun with, but it's not like completely overrunning everything that I'm trying to do or like, <laughs> you know, lost the plot of the adventure and, uh, you know, I don't have anything ready for next week. I think those are moments where you step in and say like, hey, we want this to continue. We want to still have fun let's uh, let's talk about this. And then there's a lot of different ways you can do it, right? Like you might have powerful NPCs who show up and say like, hey, we'll offer to purchase something off of a, off of a player, a particular offending item uh, or something. Mm, or yeah. there are, <laughs> you know, there are in-game ways, right? Like that, that you can start addressing those things if that's important for your group. But I would start with a conversation that says like, hey, we've, we've kind of lost the, <laughs> lost the plot here. Um, you know, in lieu of just like throwing our pieces on the table and, you know, quitting, like, how can we get back on track? It sounds like a conversation to have with your players as people. Uh, and then you talk about how it looks in the uh, in the game world uh, once you've reached a solution. I mean, like there is that that that, that thing of reputation, right, of that Bruce Lee uh, strangeness where people just start wanting wanting to pick a fight with him all the time because he was the greatest martial artist. And mm -hmm. so it would just like, I want to fight. Like, yeah. at what point does your um, your success become the biggest threat to you? Especially if you're not there yet. Like, your when your success as a character is far outreaching your abil ability to like back it up. Right. Um, <laughs> that, that, we see that in a lot of like really fun shows. I think Black Sails is a good example of like they have like all the gold in the world, um, but, but it's only causing them trouble. It's only going to cause them trouble, right? Like a, a big amount of money or, or say like a property or something like that. I'm seeing some people mention Dragon Heist uh, in the chat. And yeah, yeah, you start having pr property like in a city like Waterdeep. Like what what are the insurance rates in a place like that? You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they got wizards there and monsters. Uh, <laughs> you know, the first time uh, I ever it, ran Ravenloft, I gave them I gave them a, 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 a small a small house uh, in Barovia. <laughs> <laughs> and they had to like clear out a vampire spawn and like right. you now own property in barovia i'm like i sure. i don't know yeah. that that's a value <laughs> right. uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> not, not a really uh, money to take it over yeah yeah, yeah but, exactly. like, a good example of, of this would be pruitt's character with with black razor we got to be about you know low teens and and it's like yeah he has advantage on everything temporary mm. hit points equal to the hit points of the last thing he killed sometimes that's like an insane amount of temporary hit points that last and mm -hmm. it got to be where the fact that there was this warrior in the underdark with this weapon like people started casting divinations about him it starts attracting planar yeah. attention by the time we get to tier four he's having planar organizations and powerful people start contacting him some of them like hey we'll purchase this weapon off of you or why don't you come fight for us and then others it's not as um, you know not as pleasant they are out to steal this powerful weapon and so sort of Pruitt realizes it's that advantage is nice but it's uh, it's a liability uh, as well well it's, yeah, it's yeah. the lord of the, it's the lord of the rings issue right <laughs> like it's that like okay well great thanks elves for making all these rings and dwarves and all, everybody else that's fantastic well someone's gonna come along and find an exploit and make the one ring Right. Which, and that's all world rings is is about is like these yeah. very powerful magical well it's not the only thing but mm. often a very powerful magical item will cause you just more trouble like a palantir or the ring or whatever yep yep oh, exactly. oh definitely it, it becomes like that the old uh, like a gunslinger you know when you become top gun when you're buster scruggs right. uh, you gotta worry yeah, about yes, the very beginning is come so well done yeah, yeah. The and, kid, you know that's 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 the way it is though when there is a top dog everyone wants to knock them off and that's just human nature right uh yeah. is, is evolved as we like to think we are any everybody loves to see the person on top fall like there's that part of them uh and so you know use that as a dm you know especially if your players are getting cocky <laughs> uh well, this is this is a bit this is a bit a bigger question for you guys, and not a bigger yeah. question. But what's the longest campaign that you've ever run, and what level did you reach? Um, I'll just start off really quick. I ran a three-year campaign, mm. and by the end of it, we couldn't have been more maxed out, and we were literally uh, at we were literally top toppling an empire. <laughs> yeah, and ended up in yeah, another dimension at the end of the game. That the game mm. ended with like basically a hole in reality being torn. That sounds um, right. Nice. Yeah. 
Uh, <laughs> mine would probably be about a year. It was my first Spelljammer campaign, and, and y'all got to what, like fifteenth, sixteenth level, I think. You got Something to the like mid teens. Yeah, yeah um, mid-teens. but at the end, yeah. I think I think they had like four ships, four or five ships in their Spelljammer armada. Oh yeah. And and you know they had resources yes. all over. Jim had started a spy organization. Uh, you know, yeah, uh, I love, I love all that stuff. Yeah, yeah the yeah. cleric, the cleric. This is my favorite part. My my friend Autumn, she wants. She said, Pruitt, I want to make a rabbi. And I said, Okay, so you want to do like a religion? She's like, No, no, no. I want to make a rabbi. I want someone who worships Yahweh. And I was like, Okay, sure. And so she's literally the only cleric. And in my current campaign, they have been to that church. It is the church of the of the one true way, and they worship Yahweh. And 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 they didn't really know it, but I, I put the iconography there and I just kind of describe it a little bit differently. But it's there. And and yes, uh, you know, that, that church exists. It's the only one there. Uh, and it's the only like really formalized religion in my campaign world because I let the players take care of all that. But uh, you know, I let your players do whatever and they'll surprise you sometimes. <laughs> um, yeah, I always make an excuse for um, uh, Vikings being in D&D because the Ouroboros symbol is in every every human civilization has that Ouroboros symbol. And that's not necessarily uh, conspiracy theory stuff. That's just everyone's going to draw a snake eating its own tail. It's just like, right. that's like a little kid mythology. <laughs> doodle. You're going to do it eventually. <laughs> like, nope. And everyone has. <laughs> But it's a fun th- it's a fun way of tying that in. Like, ooh, the Ouroboros. Well, he, what is that doing here? I'm like, well, yeah, yeah everyone's uh, going to do it. <laughs> I think my longest running campaign was a little over two years. It was not Dungeons and Dragons. It was uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay uh, Second Edition, um, and we just got done. We like we didn't finish it. I think we just were like, hey, we're super tired of playing. It's been a long time playing this one game. Uh, We've done everything that was, you know, that we wanted to do with it and just sort of put it down and walked away. Uh, but mm-hmm. I've run multiple D&D games and, and several editions of D&D that have lasted at least into the high teens, if not 20s. Most of those are between a year and two years um, that, uh, that I've had. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, but now with technology, we've got some other things going on. Yeah. Uh, when do you ever, as a DM or a player, ever look glance at chat and see an idea that's good and then implement it? I totally. This, I, I have, I have as a DM, someone like wrote something smarter than that, what I was doing. I was like, okay, well, yeah, that's what I was going to do. Sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so this happens. This has happened a few times. Oh yes, it has. Yeah, happened. yeah, sure. Yeah, that has definitely happened in my like Star Wars player. Yeah, I, I do. I find I do it more as a player. I'm a terrible player. Like I just be for real with you guys. I am a I am a garbage. I just I play so little, right? Like I I don't really. Yeah. Have, I have like maybe two characters I can like think of as like my characters, and so I just I usually I approach problems from a DM's perspective, which when I'm a player is frustrating because I'm like, oh wait, I can't wait. I I gotta you know I I can't just decide this thing happens. Um, mm-hmm. And so I usually will like just keep an eye on chat because there's somebody in there who'll be like, oh, this is going on. I'm like, oh yeah, that's that's a good idea. I'll do that instead. Um, so yeah, I that's uh, I usually do that uh, for a player. There you go. Thank you, uh, WebDM, for uh, for restoring my con- uh, my self esteem there, chat. <laughs> but, how are you, John? <laughs> Uh, oh no yeah and I totally I have done that multiple times in my Star Bound campaign it's always just been like little tweaks like uh, like the reason why a bad guy was there or like somebody was gonna show up uh, but yeah I mean hey that, that's what I love about about the internet is it's just like a giant brain it's like crowdsourcing is just like a different way to look at like a brain all these different neurons firing to coming you know to come to a conclusion and uh, you know if you got the chat there, use it. You know, uh, they don't have to just donate like over on Encounter Roleplay and to give you stuff. You know, if they're if they're commenting on it, and it's good enough. Why not? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Idea sourcing is interesting. Yeah, mm-hmm. live during a game. Like, I don't know what to do, and then like beg chat well, for an yeah. answer. What spell yeah. should I prep? <laughs> <laughs> Especially for new players, like there might be something to be said. Like, if you're a new player and you're playing a wizard, oh man. Oh. I mean, even if I'm playing a wizard right now. I don't. Yeah. I I started mainly with wizards, and I gotta say I am so rusty, and I have all that old AD and D knowledge that doesn't yep. jive. Doesn't fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah different so, spells like, now. I, yeah, 
Yeah, and also yep. like you know, even from fourth edition, there's no mana magic for wizards now. Like I'm like, ah, what, what can oh, I yeah. do? Sorcerers, <laughs> I find blissfully simple for me now as a magic user. I, I can wrap my head around a sorcerer. Warlocks are a yeah. little um all over the place, but obviously I I love a warlock. Still. So yeah, mm-hmm. it's hard. It's just a collection of magic powers mostly. I yeah, I, it, it's a it's a fun hodgepodge. If you want a little bit of everything <laughs> and a little bit of nothing. Well, yeah. Warlocks are for you. <laughs> you want that one thing that you can do pretty damn well? Sure. There you go. I can disguise self whenever I want. <laughs> yep. uh, which which is yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Anytime well, you want to have uh, like preparing for prom montages, so you can just. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Jim and Jonathan, so much for being on the show. I am. Are we at the top of the hour? I think we're at the top of the hour. Yeah, we are. Uh, so. um, well, I think I need to start, like, because Todd Talks, I feel like I have to, like, live up to the standard of this name at this point, um, mm-hmm. which is not just talking, but also really cheesy affirmations at the end of every uh, session. So let's see. Mm-hmm. Let's see what I prepared that maybe I could. Oh, remember that you get zero experience for the adventures you never go on. Mm. I want that on a poster. Yeah. Wave, waves right crashing there. against a cliff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, yeah. Th- th- this will be an entire line of D&D Beyond uh, motivational posters. Mm-hmm. Sweet. Yeah. With like, Idiot. yeah. With a kobold hanging from a tree. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Looking super also cute. start another show. Right, Todd, an angry Todd party of, uh, <laughs> underneath. Todd you, affirmations. You start, yeah. You need to start a panel... A show called Ooh. Todd Man Out, where you're the uh, you're Man the Out. one dis- you're the one dissenting viewpoint from a group in a group of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The devil's you're advocate welcome. always. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you start with a you start with a you're like the CR system works perfectly, oh, no God. problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Change my mind. <laughs> Change my mind. I I, I, would, yeah, I would just do that to Chris Perkins all the time. Like sorcerers are my yeah. favorite. <laughs> Everyone should get access to all spells. Mm, yeah, agreed. Mm. I don't see a problem with that. One spellcaster class. Oh my god. Oh, I see. Mm. I see me starting a lot of fights. A lot of fights. <laughs> Backup was not broken. Um, yeah, there's a couple of things. Bonus I love are great. Backo, and that's no BS. Backo, <laughs> Backo was, was great, and really, that I think that was the test of like everyone's ability. Uh, sure. Well, I, 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 we're wrap it up. We've gone off the rails. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys so much for being on the show, Mr. Jim, Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you for being on Todd Talks. This has been our talk. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.